And for today's lecture, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Joshua Snyder as the distinguished speaker. Dr. Snyder is an assistant professor at the National Defense College Abu Dhabi. Previously, he has taught at School of Politics, History and International Relations at the University of Nottingham's campus in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. His particular area of interest remains in design and operationalization of countering violent extremism policy in the regions of Indo-Pacific and the MENA region. He's the author of multiple books and peer-reviewed papers. The discussant for today's lecture is Professor Urshi Salim Hashmi. Professor Urshi specializes in religious violent conflicts, counter-violent extremism, and conflict resolution with special focus on South Asia. She's currently heading the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the National Defense University, Islamabad. She has widely published in both national and international journals with frequent appearances as speaker in international conferences and media. Now, before I invite the worthy speaker, Dr. Joshua Snyder for his lecture, I request Director Research as the Acting President IPRI for his opening remarks. Brigadier Dr. Rashid Vali Jinjua, please. Thanks, Usama. General Raza is it, the, Mr. Joshua, Professor Ashi, uh, distinguished uh, participants of this session. On behalf of Islamabad Policy Research Institute, I extend my gratitude to you to, for having come and spared this time for us. Uh, today's topic is a series of uh, distinguished lecture series. So we host uh, these events by calling experts in respective fields who come and uh, uh, enlighten us with their views. And the uh, best part is that uh, the question answer session that should elicit the best that we have in our guest speaker. Mr. Joshua has, uh, has been highlighted by Osama, is a very accomplished scholar, is presently UAE uh, as a member of faculty of UAE Defense College. His work is on counter-violent extremism and terrorism. So these are uh, some of the elements uh, and the subjects that we are living. This is a living reality for us. While the people may uh, read that as a esoteric concept, in uh, books, and we have a whole series of them, <clears throat> right starting from the counter insurgency uh, literature, coming to the terrorism of the 90s, then sagging into a new virulent strain of 2000s, and now coming after two decades, it has a tendency to resurrect itself in various variants with a metronomic regularity. The each age leaves its mark. Technology, AI, you know, uh, uh, quantum computing, social media outreach, the blurring of the boundaries. So these are all lowering the thresholds and enabling those actors to use terrorism as a low cost option to create disruptions in the society. So like technology, this terrorism and counter violent and violent extremism has become a big disruptor of this time. So uh, we uh, would uh, like to uh, listen to Mr. Joshua who has got his work in this field. And we would expect that he should relate uh, the theoretical constructs with the reality that we are living here. And uh, I would uh, like each one of you to ask the searching questions so as to relate the discourse to our practical reality. So with these few words, I won't like to interpose myself any further and uh, would like to make whatever uh, limited time we have to its maximum potential. So over to uh, Mr. Joshua you. for your discourse. Thank you very much. All right. How can I control this? The uh, is there a clicker? 
I can't help myself with the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Occupational hazard being an academic. All right. Lovely to be with you today. Thank you so much for the invitation. And it's my great honor to be a, a distinguished speaker here at IPRI in Islamabad. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, preventing and countering violent extremism in the Indo-Pacific and the challenges of programming capacity building. For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking about the Indo-Pacific Whoops! in the context primarily of Southeast Asia, and I'll talk a little bit about Sri Lanka because I think there are some interesting dynamics going on there right now. I'm not going to talk about Pakistan. <laughs> uh, far be it for me to come to your house and um, lecture you on issues associated with violent extremism or extremism in general in your own country. So we can save that for the Q&A. Uh, and if, you, but what I would encourage you to do is think about what I'm about the the points that I raise in your own national context, right? How universal or how uh, interregional are these themes? So, I'm going to talk about where we are now. Uh, CVE as an approach or a durable solution to extremism some background on the extremism issue in Southeast Asia, CVE agendas in the region, and some of the challenges associated with capacity building in this area. And I think there are recurring themes here, and, and the, these include problems with context and definition, and people who work on this encounter this all the time. How, how do we, what are the parameters with which we define subjects like extremism and terrorism. What counts as extremist discourse? This is particularly relevant in societies that have trajectories of freedom of expression and that are democratic in nature. How do we blend people's right to express themselves with a then labeling somebody an extremist? Somebody says, I'm just expressing the way I, I feel. Um, and then in the, in the Southeast Asian context, the, the, what I see is the diverging goals or paths between how states in the region see this problem and how their legacy partners see this problem. And I see a widening chasm here where the, the West's interest in CVE issues in this part of the world don't always match with how states themselves see the problem. And this is the source of kind of bilateral tension. I'll just talk a little bit about myself uh, in, in, in terms of my own background and how I came upon this field. I began my career as a young guy working for the Canadian government, and I was, I was hosted at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. And this was at the, at the height of the global war on terror and the, and the height of Canada's involvement in the ISAF mission, I spent a lot of my time um, dealing with the sort of bilateral aspects between Canada and the U.S. on Canada's participation in ISAF. So that was my initial interest in this. And then I went back to grad school and I did one thesis looking at um, trajectories of mobilization or violent transformation of uh, jihadist groups in Indonesia. Uh, and I finished that project sort of unsatisfied because I, I, I finished that project thinking, well, okay, I think I understand this, but the bigger set of questions here in my mind are the ones related to nationalism, ones related to contested nationalism and contested versions of the state and how the state should look, right? Why are people engaged in what they're doing? Uh, so I did my PhD looking at sectarian nationalism in Indonesia. Uh, and that that gives you some sort of entree into how, how I got interested in this. And over the years, I've done consulting work for uh, Western governments in the UN system and, and all this stuff. So moving on. Um, in the Southeast Asian region, extremism is a security problem or 
represents a series of, of problems. And I think we, we need to look at this in a number of ways, a number of contexts we can look at how extremism functions as a security problem in Southeast Asia. There's the context of the global war on terror, which was the sort of dominant discourse for a very long time. And the idea that Southeast Asia might emerge as the second front. So people were proffering the idea of a sort of uh, a terror domino theory, right? Where Al Qaeda was this multinational global terror inc, spreading its tentacles all over the world, and one by one states might fall, or at least fall victim, or at least be impacted severely. So the sort of G Watt thesis. Um, this was never all that convincing in the Southeast Asian context, and people who. People tried to make this argument, but the kind of academics stepped in and said, mm, there are dynamics, but really uh, violent sectarianism is really about something else in this part of the world. Um, questions about nationalism and versions, why do we have versions of aggressive identity politics that inspire violence. So then in terms of the why questions, are we talking about responses to dispossession or in poor governance? Are we talking or are we talking about grievance narratives? So these are the ways that we can look at extremism or conceptualize the debates over extremism in the Southeast Asian region. Who is this a policy problem for? Well, two distinct contexts for how extremism functions as a policy problem in this part of the world. The states themselves, who have definite issues with this, as we'll talk about in the, in, in the coming slides, and the national security and development priorities of partner states, i.e. the West, however we want to define the West here. The context of Southeast Asia, the, the, this would be the United States, Australia, Britain, and the Netherlands, and the EU would be the main sort of uh, Western actors or partners involved with, with uh, extremism. So the, the policy context for, for these two sets of actors are very different. There was some commonality in, in, in the years of, of the global war on terror, but I think that, that as we move on, um, the priorities are, the gulf is growing wider. And the other part of the policy problem or the policy problem for whom question is this relationship between terrorism and extremism, right? We see terrorism as an end in terms of acts of violence, right? Uh, extremism as a category is much more amorphous. It's far more complicated. How do we define extremism? And I'm going to talk about this in the Indonesian context where it's incredibly complicated. Right? Where do we draw the line between somebody's right to, a, to express an opinion about sectarian life and then being branded an extremist? So this complex relationship between terrorism and extremism, and in many states, there was a problem with disastrously high recidivism rates amongst detainees. So states began to, to deal with this problem in the early 2000s, and the response, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, was kinetic, right? A kinetic response of, of hunting people down and locking them up. And it worked. But then the prisons were filling up, and people were being released from prison, and they were going right back to their previous lives. So recidivism rates, and I can't see my bottom my bottom slide. Ah. If all, if only I had a photographic memory. Do, 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 do. Ah, and yes, the relationship between donors and no. Oops. It's not going back. Yes, there we are. Um, and I guess the other problem here at the policy level is uh, 
can we really de-link CVE as an approach from counterterrorism? Right. People in the development community that I know, at least, like to like to see CVE as something different. And maybe I've I've been around the traps too long. I I, I see them as fundamentally linked. And I think I think in terms of CVE as a solution to extremism, at certain points, this poses this poses a real problem. Um, changes in the extremist space over the past twenty five years, and I think these changes are very broad. Right. They. They apply in Southeast Asia, but they also apply elsewhere, probably here too, right? We see the extreme, the strategic environment itself has changed. The post 9-11 environment brought on changes. The post-global war on terror brought on changes. And now we have the sort of end of the ISIL era. And in, in the Southeast Asian context, all of these the, the, these epochs all represented something different. We also see fundamental changes in radicalization or mobilization, depending on what sort of language you want to use. I, I, at least some of the people I know don't like the term radicalization, right? They, so mobilization, I don't know. Um, changes, changes in this space, the role of technology and social media. When I started thinking about these issues in 2000 and six, I'm getting old. Uh, when I started thinking about the, these issues in 2006, there was no cyber extremism, at least not in the Southeast Asian context. It was, it was, a, it was totally different. So within a sh very short period of time, we've had a rapid change in how groups mobilize and this sort of uh, radicalization, if you will. An evolution from what I would observe are closed movements, vanguard movements, elite movements, as how they projected themselves, with relatively few members to something else, to, to, to bigger open movements, right? Plug and play, anyone can join, very low bar to entry. Uh, this perhaps makes attacks less successful. Right, so we sort of have uh, what I call like dime store terrorism, right? Lots of lots of plots that don't succeed, but it means you could have a much bigger pond, a much bigger pool of people involved. Also, changes in the view of states in the region and their Western partners, and I mentioned this a couple of times, um, and changes in the relationship between donors and recipient states, which speaks to this issue of uh, capacity building. So durable solutions to extremism are highly contested and they're complex. Uh, none of this is new, right? Despite the sort of uh, the amount of oxygen th these issues have garnered over the past 20 whatever years, states have been responding to non-state violent actors for very long periods of time, for generations, right? Think of the troubles in Northern Ireland. Um, the U.S. has been dealing with its own versions of, of intrastate extremism, white nationalism since the end of the, the Civil War period. Right? So nothing new about states dealing with these types of actors. Key differences in, in how we talk about categories of activity between counterterrorism, countering violent extremism, and counterinsurgency. And I see these as three distinct categories of activity that get blended together to make a fairly complicated soup, right? And doing, I would argue that doing CVE at the same time as you're doing counterinsurgency presents a lot of complications. Very, very, it, it's, it's, it, it's very tricky indeed. Um, CT approaches are aimed at increasing security legislation, intelligence, increasing policing powers to thwart terror attacks. You're looking to stop a terror attack. CV, CVE approaches are meant to be more nuanced and concerned with the structural causes of extremism itself. So very different ways of, of executing a problem. And this can raise sort of... Uh, issues between people working in bureaucracies dealing with this problem of, uh, of Venus and Mars. You know, those the, the, that series of books, Men Come From Mars, Women Come From Venus. 
with, with the difference between CVE people in, de in the development community and security people in terms of how they see this issue night and day. And I don't know if people here have, have seen this up close, but you, you, there can be big clashes. So in terms of CVE and practice, this is how this is how I see it. And others too, I guess. Um, prevention. So we said P, P stroke CVE. Prevention uh, is information oriented. Right, is broad and is looking to reach large numbers of people. The further up the pyramid you go, the more targeted it gets. Right, so we go from prevention, which is information oriented, to rehabilitation and reintegration to suppression, and suppression starts to look like counterterrorism. The strategic context in Southeast Asia. Well, th this is complicated, and you, we could do, uh, you know, could spend uh, three months talking about this. I'm going to do this as quickly as I possibly can. We have extremist violence in, 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 in Southeast Asia that comes from a common ideological origin. Um, we have issues with the Islamization or sectarianization of what was a secular interstate conflict in Thailand and the Philippines. So these started out as secular nationalist conflicts where groups felt like they didn't get their just desserts at independence, right? Or that nation state formation didn't serve particular communities. These were secular leftist struggles for decades and decades, both in Thailand, in the south of Thailand and the south of the Philippines. Gradually, both of these movements sectarianized. And how and why they did is a subject for uh, another conversation. But they did. They did. Maybe the leftist struggle burned itself out. Maybe it was a question of leadership. Um, sectarianization of domestic political agendas in Indonesia and Malaysia, right? Uh, so in Indonesia and Malaysia, the Malay world, different sets of dynamics. Uh, in Indonesia, we have a problem where the creation of the state and the failure of what was called the Jakarta Charter, which was going to create an Islamic state in Indonesia, failed. And this leaves large sections of the religious community very aggrieved. So the, the, and the um, ancestors of, of the sort of present day leaders of the extremist movements in Indonesia were in fact the same people who were pushing for this agenda at independence or after independence. So rather than this being about 9-11 or the global war on terror about US foreign policy, this is really about Indonesian nationalism and a struggle for the ideology that guides Indonesia, right? secular nationalism versus people who want something different and haven't stopped since 1947 in one way or another. Globalization, right? The globalization of religio-political activism also plays a role. Thousands of people from the Malay world fight with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s. To say it's a common story, they return home. Many of them settle into to life and lead normal lives and others believe they can continue the struggle. So this, this all comes together. We see an uptick in violence in Southeast Asia at a certain period of time because we have forces colliding, coming together. Political forces, sociocultural forces, and maybe sectarian forces. So the growth of violent religiosity in Southeast Asia and activism in the 1990s reflects several dynamics. The influence of the Afghan conflict volunteers, the grievance and sectarianization of existing conflicts, mobilization and self-defense and sectarian conflict. So we have, we have sectarian conflict in Indonesia where there's uh, fighting between Christians and Muslims in the Maluku Islands. <clears throat> 
and self-defense militias start. These self-defense militias get deployed, fighting for both sides. The conflict ends, but then members of some of these militias keep on fighting. It's another version of the Afghan story. Um, and th there's also in Indonesia a big political change. The end of 35 years of, of the new order regime, right? The Suharto regime is, is deposed, big political transition. For years, for decades, Suharto kept a lid on Islamist activism through violent suppression. Um, in the post-New Order era, the idea was that Indonesia was democratizing. And in a democracy, you have a marketplace of ideas. You have a spectrum of ideas. So the, the approach was in Indonesia, well, we have a marketplace of ideas. Therefore, extremists have their place. Extremists have a, have a place in this marketplace of ideas. They can express themselves. And until they start hurting people, or unless there's a relationship between their ideas and violence, we take a hands-off approach. So this is what explains, in my mind, this uptick in violence. So we have three, we have several phases of activism. And we, we have several groups that emerge. Jamal Islamiyah and the Abu Sayyaf group are the two sort of leading jihadist uh, groups that emerge during this period of time, both pledge allegiance to Al-Qaeda, normally whatever that means, right? Again, back to this global linkage thesis, there were people saying that both organizations were sort of under the command and control of Al-Qaeda. This was never the case. It was nothing, it was not, nothing more than sort of branding and marketing. Uh, very much local and regional issues were driving the violence, not global. It had nothing to do with U.S. foreign policy, despite what, what uh, some people might say. Four stages of activism, four, 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 uh, I would say, between 1998 and 2007. So you see, well before 9-11. The violence starts well before 9-11 in, in, in this part of the world. Uh, phase one, phase two, 27 to 2012. Phase three, 2013 to 2018, and phase four. In the first phase, the, the violence was mainly directed against Western targets in Southeast Asia. So in the Philippines, uh, the kidnapping and execution of, of tourists was very common. Um, in Indonesia, there was the bombing, uh, two big bombings in Bali, the, the bombing of the Australian embassy in Jakarta, the bombing of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, the bombing of the Marriott Hotel, on and on and on. JI begins to, fra to fragment. They weren't achieving their ends, and, and, it, and its members begin to get disaffected with the leadership. They also get, they, they get angry with the state. So in this second phase, we have a fragmentation of Jamaslamia, and they, they start to deflect their violence inwards. Rather than attacking tourists and Western targets, they start to turn on the Indonesian state itself. They start to target judges. They start to tar target low to mid-level officials. Nobody high enough that there's going to be a massive response, but ordering judges to sort of implement Sharia law when nobody can make that order in Indonesia. It's a secular state. The constitution doesn't allow for that. Threatening judges, then the judge doesn't do it, and then they kill the judge. This sort of violence. So a, a shift a shift from that to that. And then 2013 to 2018, the, the, what I call the regionalization of ISIL in, in Southeast Asia, or the isolization of these movements in Southeast Asia. And then 2018 to the present, we're in this post phase and, and it's difficult to categorize. Um, JI for a long time was the region's kind of main extremist network, the, the fellow, uh, I don't have a clicker, the older fellow is a, a guy called Abu Bakr Bashir, uh, who is, uh, uh, Indonesian Hadrami of Yemeni descent, 
Um, he founded a boarding school in the 1970s, which is still in existence, was exiled to Malaysia. The Malaysians gave him sanctuary, which is an interesting factoid that, that doesn't really get discussed. And then after the New Order ends, he returns to Indonesia. There's a, he has a problem, though, because the attacks start, and there's a disproportionate number of people involved in planning attacks who attended his school. So despite the fact that he proclaimed that he's just an activist, there was a problem because most of the perpetrators of the Bali bombings and the big Jakarta bombings were graduates of his peasantry. Uh, Indonesia's most famous sort of international terrorist, a guy called Hambali, was connected directly to Al-Qaeda, was a student also of this institution. So in the first and second phase, J.I. was the main actor in the region. The third phase is interesting. So, so we have this fragmentation in the second phase. In the third phase, we have the, we have the isolation of this regional movement. What does this mean? Well, as the, as the civil war in Syria progresses, conflict volunteerism from all over the world starts, and this includes Southeast Asia, right? Um, low intensity ethno-religious conflict in the southern Tha in southern thailand in, in the south of the philippines means that there are not large numbers of young men but fairly significant numbers of young men who know how to fight they know how to use weapons and they're either radicalized or partially radicalized they see an opportunity to fight they're recruited and they begin to travel something in the neighborhood of one to three thousand um, people from the Malay world travel to Syria to fight. There's a Southeast Asian ISO contingent called Khatib Nusantara, which is, which is comprised entirely of fighters from Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and it's interesting because th this draws both new and, and old networks. They tap old networks of people who are already activists, who are already in this life. And they also, through social media, begin to attract civilians, people who know nothing. Students, probably similar dynamics in this part of the world, right? But, but it, 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 there was both. So it wasn't just a social media thing where kids were going. It, it, there were hardened fighters who also, who also traveled. And maybe as a failure of security that these guys were known to the security services and yet, and yet were still able to sort of escape the net and board planes. That's, a, that's an, sort of an interesting case study. This fellow is, a, is, is sort of a, a poster child for the dynamics in the region and what kind of the, the problems with, with CVE. So, Bahrun uh, Naim is, a, is an Indonesian fellow. He joins the, the East Indonesian Mujahideen, the MIT, which was a JI offshoot in the mid-2000s. In 2010, he's sentenced to prison. In, in 2012, he's released. In 2013, he rejoins his organization who pledges allegiance to ISIL. In 2014, he travels to Syria 2014 to 2016, he becomes a sort of star ISIL recruiter for Southeast Asia. He's the face for, for the region and, and, go, and is powerful in drawing lots of people into the movement. Um, he plans a large attack on a, on a shopping center in Jakarta called the Serena Mall which was a sort of a suicide bombing mixed with an active shooter situation. And in 2016, he was killed by a U.S. drone strike in Syria. So this is an interesting one. He joined one organization, went to prison, came out, rejoined. The organization switches allegiance. He travels overseas and is killed by the American forces. So this guy supposedly went through de-radicalization. This guy went through an in-prison program. And it didn't obviously have much impact on him.
we can see my if you can see my busy slide there. The point of this slide is the resources are going towards the conflict zones, right? The resources are going from the places in Southeast Asia that have money to the places where there are there's an active uh, active insurgency, the south of Thailand and the south of the Philippines. So then Malaysia becomes a <clears throat> recruiting ground, both for fighters and money, which is going to the south. So this is this regionalization, right? Subnational problems, problems at the national level, but also a regional issue in that we have poor, porous maritime borders, very difficult to stem the flow of people within this region, nearly impossible. May, <clears throat> May to October 2016, the siege of Marawi. Uh, the south of the Philippines groups begin, the, the Abu Sayyaf group splinters, splinter factions of ASG pledge allegiance to ISIL and returned fighters um, start to claim territory. They start to actually hold territory and they, they held a town for a period of some months. And it took, and the, the, the armed forces of the Philippines actually had to really fight. It wasn't just a policing matter. It was a, it was a full on battle to, to dislodge them. And they flattened the town in the process. This was a wake up call uh, to a lot of security people in Southeast Asia who really sort of saw extremism as a structural problem, but a low level structural problem. Uh, and one that was really not worthy of maximum attention the fact that a group like this could actually occupy and hold territory for a period of time was really quite disturbing emerging threats um there seems to be a linkage between from what i can see the conflict zones and dispossession and the appeal of this ideology especially in the social media space Conflict environments bolster the appeal of movements who focus on grievance narratives. So the, I worry about um, the Rohingya. I worry about the, and, uh, not only the human tragedy there um, and the suffering uh, that the Rohingya face, but that this might become a sort of source of mobilization. Um, it hasn't so far, which is interesting, but everybody's kind of people in this community are kind of wondering if and when it's going to happen, right? Is, is um, going to fight in Myanmar going to be for uh, the region's extremists the next Syria? Only this one is much closer to home. <clears throat> Evolution of the response. So the in, in terms of how states have dealt with this issue in Southeast Asia, there's a number of phases. And the, the, the first phase was very much CT focused, it was very much about the kinetic decapitation of networks, large numbers of detainees, gloves off. Uh, the Indonesian police, as well as as the armed forces of the Philippines and the Thai military were adept at dealing with this problem kinetically. The problem was, despite this success, the kinetic approach didn't work. Jails were filling up, high recidivism rates. There was a, an, a, a view that more had to be done, that a kinetic approach wasn't enough. Enter CVE. Enter the discussion of extremism being related to, but delinked from terrorism itself. So say, well, this problem isn't going away. This is a structural feature of our society. We have these attacks frequently. It's not going to work to just execute this threat using kinetic force all the time. We have to address root causes. We have to think about root causes. Seriously. I remember when I was doing field work <clears throat> for my MA in 2006, I was interviewing officials in Indonesia. And at that point, the, the, the discourse was interesting from officials because they were really, they didn't want to 
engage in any kind of internal discussion about extremism. They attributed everything to the outside. There's a phrase called cognitive dissonance. Has has you ever heard of this? I, I, I encountered that when I interpreted it as a cognitive dissonance from officials, where it was all about US foreign policy. It was all about Israel. It was all about this. It was all about this. There was no wanting to acknowledge that there were internal issues. In the second phase, this begins to change. As the violence turns inward, Indonesian officials couldn't ignore it. And they actually say, you know, we have a structural problem here. We have to go beyond CT and we have to begin to think about extremism itself, which sets off a whole other set of questions. Thus, in the second phase, we have the development of uh, PCVE interventions. And that goes back to that pyramid that I showed, ranging from uh, work in the information environment to in prison programs to all this all this type of things. Uh, phase three in, in the the isolation of this challenges PCVE efforts. Um, the previous PCVE agenda was really designed for uh, the one point version of this ideology. It wasn't designed for social media. It wasn't designed for conflict volunteerism. There were no mechanisms to flag people traveling, people coming home from overseas, what to do with people when they return. States in the region were, in terms of the CVE space, were really caught off guard, like big time. Um, there was just no plan. So do you detain people when they come home? What do you do? Um, in the first phase of, this, of, of, of CVE, the, the focus was on de-radicalization. So the first efforts in, in terms of doing CVE properly in this region focused on de-radicalization, or as I was corrected, they said, no, we were not calling it that, now we're calling it disengagement. Because who, who's to say what a radical is? So disengagement is the, is, the, is the term that's preferred, led by Western-funded NGOs, right? So there was no capacity in this phase. In, in, in the Southeast Asian context, Western NGOs did the heavy lifting in the CVE space. States took a hands-off approach. There were ad hoc efforts undertaken by the ULEMA, uh, but there was no coordination between the NGOs delivering programs and the ULEMA who were doing the who, who were doing the religious side of things. Um, little official interest in prevention or rehabilitation, and little or no benchmarking on the efficacy of the approaches. So people were just doing stuff, like throwing, throwing darts, and there, was no, there, there were no measures. In the second phase, there's a greater emphasis on prevention. So then we enter the P in the CVE. More media work, more social media work, more focus on what, what was labeled peaceful coexistence. Right. Also, a growing nationalization or, or of, of PCVE programming, right? States is exerting sovereignty. And I saw this in, in all states across the region, where states became deeply uncomfortable with the reality that they had essentially outsourced their CVE function to Western NGOs. It's like sunlight in Indonesia, I just like it happened overnight. Somebody got the memo very high up, and it was like, uh oh. And very quickly, they started to exert sovereignty over this, right? So how does that manifest in the Indonesian context? Indonesia establishes a, a national counterterrorism agency, publishes a counter-extremism strategy, signs MOUs with NGOs, and forces NGOs to pick a side. They say, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make you stop cooperating with Western NGOs, but if you do, you get no help from the Indonesian state. And most of the NGOs said, well, then we can't operate. If we can't, if, if we don't, if we can't communicate with security services, then we, we, we have nothing, there's no space. So that, that really uh, changed the, the, the grounds. And M Malaysia, for its part, adopts moderation 
uh, as a policy platform, there's there's lots of internal discussion in Malaysia at this time on peaceful coexistence and moderation. And the Philippines grants autonomy to Mindanao and normalizes the, the moral Islamic liberation front. So the Philippines has a few sectarianized fighting fighting groups. There's the MILF and, the, and Abu Sayyaf. The MLI, MILF is actually integrated to some degree into the armed forces of the Philippines. So the state begins to work with the MILF. Again, tense relations between states and Western NGOs, right? I, I, so many people I talk to in Indonesia at this point were basically saying half the time we were concerned that the sort of CVE work done by Western NGOs is really intelligence gathering. Uh, and and when we don't like that, and I, I I saw no evidence of that directly in my interactions, but that was that was definitely their perception. Capacity. What do I mean by capacity? The state's ability to ad to address and define issues associated with violent extremism at tactical, strategic, and operational levels. Right? The sum total of resources, will, and planning. Does the state have the money? Does it have the will? Do, do internal politics allow for this? And is there a strategy? So when I talk about capacity in PCVE, this is what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, as I said, in the early phase, there was clearly a lack of capacity in all areas. There, there was no, people weren't, just weren't thinking about extremism. They were thinking about stopping terrorism. So they, bolstered the security services, they set up a, a counterterrorism police, but they weren't, they, this, this stuff, they said, that's for the NGOs, but the NGOs do that. Capacity building challenges, and I'm almost done. Capacity building challenges. Uh, questions of definition and scale. Again, uh, back to this, and I don't think it's answerable, but how do we define extremism? How much and how many? Right? Program design. Right. Should if if people are incarcerated, is CVE voluntary? Is disengagement voluntary if somebody is is essentially forced to do it? Program implementation. Who should do it? Right. Should these programs be the domain of specialized NGOs? Should they be the domain of security services? Should they should they be the domain of should it be the domain of psychologists or ulema? Right. And this is the, the this in in every national context. These are ongoing. Who owns this issue? And there's no agreement in Indonesia. There's certainly there's tense disagreement on this. Um, intention, right? Is the, is the goal prevention or is the goal disengagement? Two very different things, right? Uh, dealing with people who are already, who prover proverbially or literally have blood on their hands, helping them to see the light and live better lives and make better choices for themselves versus a large pool of people who might be vulnerable. How do you target who's vulnerable? And I have, I've had this conversation about CV, PVE messaging in the Southeast Asian context. I said, well, in Indonesia, how do you target the messaging? To whom? Everybody, most people are fairly poor by World Bank standards of poverty. Is it a poverty issue? Is it a rural issue? Nobody really knows, right? So people throw these throw these concepts around. In some cases, it's very clear, like in the south of the Philippines, if it's ethno-sectarian, then you're dealing with a smaller group. Then you're, okay, that's fine. But if you're dealing with a, a religious group, who do you, who do you target? Um, and then again, secular versus sectarian approaches. Is this about cult deprogramming? Or is this about religious re-education? Or is it about some version of both? And I don't know if anybody really knows what the balance is, right? I, I've, I've seen these programs in action in prison, and it seems like some of these guys need help, psychological help, and others of them seem like they don't need help, and they are just angry, violent people <laughs> who, who, who have made decisions about what to do. So, you know, the, a priest or a psychiatrist, um, 
do states lack capacity, really? Or is this about funding, will, or politics? And in the Indonesian context, I, this, and in, in, in uh, Thailand and the Philippines, it's, 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 I think it's some combination of all of it. In the Indonesian context, definitely politics were a problem in the beginning. Politics were a big problem. It was easier for the state to focus on counterterrorism, to be reactive, and not getting into the politics of using the extremist label. I believe in the, in the Indonesian context, nobody wanted to use the extremist label because that would set off a big internal discussion. And domestically, that was not palatable at the time. Uh, the current president of Indonesia has been much more forceful in using this label and in developing a strategy and actually declaring this ideology anti-nationalist. Right. So, you know, you can't you, you can't be an Indonesian and an Islamist at the same time. These two things are diametrically opposed. Right? We see this in the Gulf, too, now to varying degrees in, in, in some of the states. Um, and in certainly in the south of Thailand and the south of Philippines, there's this issue of grievance and power sharing religio ethnic minorities who don't feel like they got their just desserts and central governments led by Buddhists in Thailand and Christians in the Philippines who are probably never going to give these groups the accommodation they want. Right. So the, the, these are sort of generational intractable conflicts. Thailand, the fighting has been going on since the 50s and 60s and the Philippines, it's the same. Right. So some difficult questions. What's the relationship between nonviolent and violent extremism? Right. How much, how much nonviolent extremism are states willing to accept? The US is confronting this right now, right? How much white Donald Trump is prepared to accept a fairly high degree of white nationalism? He didn't call it a security problem. Right. So how much extremism is acceptable? When does when does it become a problem and who gets to decide the drivers of extremism? Right. The age old question, poverty, grievance or ideology. And can legacy partners, can Western states see beyond their own national security interests in being good CVE partners to states dealing with these problems? And I'm a little skeptical. I don't know. Um, is there a gulf in perception between legacy partners and states in the region on this issue? And I think there is. I mean, Australia, for its part, is interested in counterterrorism. Um, they're interested in Australians being able to go to Bali and have holidays and not get blown up. They're not interested really in the deeper societal issues that are driving this. So they want, they want quick ends. When they invest in this, they want to see appreciably that, that things are changing quickly and things are changing in the way they want. And the Indonesian government is, isn't, always able to, isn't always able to do that. Uh, opportunities, how to, how to turn opportunities, threats and challenges into opportunities in this area. Well, there's definitely a, an, an opening for states to diversify their capacity building partnerships. Uh, and, you know, um, certainly looking to sub, some Gulf states uh, who, are, who, who are interested in getting involved in this, a, a, a bit controversial, but they're interested in this. Um, Turkey uh, is, is, is talking about helping states with, with capacity building in this area. Uh, the question is, is diversification of capacity building partnerships possible? And what help do states actually need? A national dialogue on these issues, right? The U.S. absolutely needs to have a national dialogue on white nationalism and extremism. So we're not just talking about states in this part of the world or Southeast Asia, right? This is a global problem. But there's an opportunity here for states to have a dialogue on these deep issues and thought and action leadership on the part of strategic leaders, right? To, to, really, to really get in front 
um, takeaways. I'll conclude by saying, you know, I, I think this is a regional problem with varying dynamics at the sub-national level. So yes, it's regional and the dynamics within the states differ. Uh, CVE is a complex response. It's a complicated response that raises questions about the distinction between terror and extremism and the blurred lines between violent and nonviolent extremism. Who are you targeting your CVE at? What's the, what's the prevention being meant to do? In the first phase, regional CVE interventions and program in programming were dominated by Western states, and we're seeing increased national sovereignty over this and sometimes tense relations between Western civil society and national governments. That's the other context here, right? Um, what gets linked to CVE? Gender issues in Indonesia, there's a, a, because there was so much funding for CVE, every NGO under the sun started to talk about CVE and linking whatever their pet issue was to extremism, including issues like gender. Not saying gender is an important issue, but how, how does it get to a point where we sort of we leave this sort of reasonable grounds? Capacity and capacity building presupposes that states in the region lack this. Do states in, in the region actually lack capacity in the CVE sphere? I think that great strides have been made. I don't think we're at in 2000 or 2005 anymore. So maybe it's not as true as it was. And was ISIL really a game changer? At the time, I remember, at least in in Southeast Asia, the, the discourse was that ISIL was going to be a game changer and it was going to sort of um, change the tectonics of Islamist religious activism in Southeast Asia. That didn't really happen, right? It didn't really, it, draw some, it, it drew some new constituents momentarily, and then that was it. So it's the expression, old wine, new bottle, or new bottle, old wine. Um, those are my takeaways. Thank you all very much for your for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Joshua Snyder. Now I will ask uh, Dr. Urshi Salim Hashmi to kindly, you know, enlighten us uh, with her remarks. And as you go along, you know, I would like to request you to kindly contextualize uh, some of those takeaways or some of these insights. Uh, Dr. Schneider, uh, sorry, Dr. Snyder has shared with us uh, with respect to how Pakistan has sort of grappled with this challenge and tried to overcome the threat of extremism from myriad of factors across Pakistan. So over to you, ma'am. Sure, of course, by all means. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you. And it was quite a comprehensive <laughs> um, presentation, Dr. Joshua, um, and particularly, uh, you know, when it comes to Indonesia, um, um, in some context and or other, we, we've been um, writing and discussing, and in fact, some of the comparative studies that uh, I actually, I also did uh, Indonesia and Pakistan, because we were trying to see the CT uh, counterterrorism, um, uh, you know, um, policies that Indonesians, um, uh, successive regimes, they adopted and how successfully they did that. But of course, the context is um, different. Um, but then there are similarities also. And while listening to you, um, I realized, and I jotted down some of the things also, uh, that there are indeed some similarities um, uh, when we talk about uh, the distinction between, um, you know, CT and the CVE. But then, um, you know, the problem with people who, who work in the area, who have this uh, area of research is that it's very difficult to contain. So I'm not going to bore you with another one hour. And of course, you have had a really, really good uh, presentation. What I did was... I jotted it down some of the points so that we can have, um, you know, um, uh, uh, a very uh, sort of in a, in some direction, um, a brief, uh, you know, uh, comments. And then uh, in the question answer session, of course, I would uh, like to um, respond to any other thing. 
when it comes to Pakistan's perspective, um, how we see this thing, and since we are talking about PVE preventing uh, or countering violent extremism, but prevention, uh, it's a relatively new concept in our part of the world. So while we had uh, worked on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism, and in that context, a lot of um, policies and programs uh, that had already been carried out, preventing violent conflict. Um, uh, um, extremism is something uh, that is still, um, you know, relatively a new idea. How? Because when you, you talk about prevention, what exactly you're talking about? I mean, we have to really go to um, to the conception um, and theoretical idea of prevention, or even if you take a literal meaning of prevention, you are trying to prevent something to happen. Now, that does not mean that something that has not ha happened and you are only trying to do that, but something that has happened, but you think that, you know, once you start the peace building process, like in post-conflict situation, when we start a peace building process, we try to get into a peacemaking or conflict resolution uh, process, trying to establish some of the thing. Even at that time, you try to come up with policies and strategies that can prevent the potential conflict or the potential violence that can happen. So it's a two-way thing. So while you're dealing with something that has happened, you are uh, focusing on those areas, weaknesses, but then you are also trying to come up with those uh, policies that can um, prevent um, things that had happened. Um, and when I say this, why I'm saying this, because it leads us to a political, uh, it leads us to politics, actually. So prevention is all politics. It's the politics, not politics, not in a negative sense, but a political process. The more you have political engagement, the more you have people having a sense of ownership and a sense of belonging and a sense of participation, the more they would be willing to listen things that you would be telling them, the state or the regime or the government. Because the sense of belonging and sense of ownership without that, if you think that you can implement counter-violent extremism or preventing uh, violent extremism strategies, that is not going to happen. It's not the CT. In counter-terrorism, you have a target. You have already declared groups who are challenging the rate of the state, who are already using violence. So you are taking the counterterrorism uh, actions and programs because you are, you know that there is this relationship as the state and the group which is challenging the rate of the state. What do we do with people having ideas, extremist ideas, and they may be the sympathizers or the supporters or the ones, the facilitators, how do you deal with them? You, of course, you don't deal with them with counterterrorism strategy because you have not yet categorized them as the enemy. So counter-violent extremism is something that you are actually doing within the society, with the people who are yet not categorized as the enemy, but you know the potential and the tendencies, and there are some people here and there. How do you do that? You do it through politics, the political process, the right political process. Now, um, just to give you an idea about how I see CVE, so obviously it's a strategy which deals with violent extremism, Preparing the next crisis by focusing on the underlying issues, as Dr. Joshua has already talked about, those issues, the governance issues, the problems, the grievances, all those issues which are there in the first place. And, um, when we talk about uh, CVE, uh, PCVE, in fact, uh, in peace studies, we are actually talking about the structural violence. So the father of the peace studies, Johan Galtung, talked about structural violence, identifying those issues and problems that, like, you have also talked about uh, those, uh, you know, discriminatory policies or um, marginalization. Why you are having those groups and peoples who have a very clear idea of using violence, there is this... Um, 
um, majority of the people who have um, grievances and marginal, uh, you know, policy, um, uh, the discontent uh, feeling. So, in order to address those structural issues or structural violence, um, we need to take certain steps. And those steps actually lead you to sustainable peace. And that sustainable peace is prevention, actually. So while you are doing certain things, but you are preventing, so it's a cycle. It's not something that it's, uh, you know, wants you to take certain uh, steps and then um, you're done. It has to continue. So I think in societies like, uh, especially in the global South, this process of uh, prevention or, um, you know, preventive mechanism, it's an ongoing process. It's not just that because a certain group has challenge or use the violence, you apply certain PCVE strategies. No, it's an ongoing process that continues in order, to, and it's a very long uh, process, but in order to have sustainable peace or in other words, positive peace. Uh, in Pakistan context, I think uh, one of the things, uh, because we, uh, we are talking about PCVE, we have to address some fundamental issues in the context of peace education. So norms, ideas, values that are already present in conservative social structures should not be challenged due to any model. So what we have been dealing with is, um, um, as you have all already uh, talked about, um, there's Western ideas, but then that does not mean that those Western ideas are always wrong. I mean, there are good things also, of course. But then labeling them, how you present them to the society, and those things, norms and values should not be taken as challenging the already existing norms and values because then it becomes counterproductive. And all your efforts that you are trying, and we have experienced that thing. So in the context of Pakistan, we have actually experienced, despite our good intentions and uh, um, using the resources and um, you know, all different kinds of uh, engagements with the other members and the uh, civil society, why and how it happened that uh, when it comes to the hard uh, approach, which is the counterterrorism, we managed to successfully do that um, uh, various operations um, in different areas. But when it comes to the soft approach, we had to deal with certain challenges. And those challenges mainly they emerge from those um, um, uh, feelings within the society, the, the, the problems with the acceptability uh, of certain ideas, which perhaps we could have labeled them with more localized Region, then they could have um, had a different impact. When it comes to um, uh, you know the, uh, the preventing violent extremism, uh, what is critical is an investment in impact evaluation. I mean, we 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 do talk about it uh, that uh, completion of a project is not something, unfortunately, in countries like, uh, you know, in most of the underdeveloped countries or developing countries. So what turned out to be in last 20, 25 years that a completion of a project uh, became the objective. So you got the funding or you had the collaboration with another state, you had a certain objective, you wanted to do that, you start with good intention, but then, you know, while doing that, the only objective that you have is whether you have um, sort of a checklist that you have uh, got it completed or not, um, instead of looking. So how do you value the impact? That impact is important, and this, this is what we need, the kind of investment, and not just a monetary sense, but the intellectual investment in sort of uh, looking at the follow-ups, uh, the continuity, how do we evaluate what we are doing is actually making an impact. Then, of course, the tangible and intangible issues also, because it's a long-term sustainable thing. How do you really see the impact coming immediately after a six-month or a six-years project? It may not come even six years. It may take a decade. But then you, the I think the markers, the metrics should also be, uh, you know, needs to be revised. Um, how you see the completion of a certain thing, whether it is the completion of the project or the actual impact that the um, society has 
Now, I would like to highlight some of the points, um, uh, although um, you you did talk about that, but in the context of uh, Pakistan, when I look at it and what you were talking about, an important perspective um, to consider is while dealing with various groups involved in extremism in a country like Pakistan or any other similar country where they follow a certain ideology. So one ideology, they are the followers of an ideology. How do we can geographically make of the followers? It requires, um, you know, it matters a lot. So the follower of a similar ideology plays in different part of the similar country. So the state has a, one policy to counter those or to deal with those, but then in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, society, you have different people with different sets of norms and ideas. How do you do that? Would you really follow the same national narrative and national policy, or would you, within the country, also go for that? So we confront, I mean, uh, with such problems, and we did have um, such problems when it comes to CVE. Second point is about the sympathizers, uh, who may not be the members of the group, but they, of course they agree with the uh, ideology. When they get into mainstream politics, and somehow, obviously through contesting the elections, their approach resonate with the group's ideology. Now, they are not the members of those groups, but they, of course, play an important role in deepening the impact of their ideas. So, but then they may not, uh, not come um, in that radar. So while you are focusing your operations towards those declared groups, and you are trying to achieve the objectives or complete your task, but then what about those who do not come in that radar, but they do have the same um, ideology. And in the mainstream also, in countries, um, and in many countries, in fact, how do they manage that? And in fact, uh, they do face a problem. The third problem in evaluation of the impact of the efforts, uh, as I said already, is tangibility, whether they are, they are not tangible there. So we have to see, I've already talked about that. A fundamental mistake in CVE and PCVE this course is focused on extremism defined in religious context only. Now, countries that we, I mean, we are talking about countering violent extremism. We are not saying countering religious extremism. So violent extremism could be, uh, because countries, uh, including Pakistan, we do face uh, groups who have political ideas and motivations, and they do um, challenge the rid of the state or use violence or insurgencies, and in many other countries, how do you deal with them? So your CVE, your PCV framework, if it is focused only on um, you know, um, uh, uh, problems which have uh, religious context, how do you do that? And um, there is a need to design context-focused uh, programs in areas uh, facing insurgencies, especially politically radicalized groups. Um, and uh, the fifth important thing is about the NGOs. Uh, uh, you did talk about it, and I think the NGOs can uh, definitely they become the solid, resilient structures. Because we do need uh, those structures also. Um, uh, but then they want their own donors uh, sort of, uh, you know, only if they go beyond the donors' specific targets or objectives. Um, because what happened is that the higher priority to in project learning, it, it doesn't really happen most of the time. It's always the completion of the project. So, so if we if we really think that the NGOs part of the civil society, they do have a role in CVE, then the in project learning is something that is a very important. In case of Pakistan, more efforts are required. Um, um, you talked about, and I think it's this, one of the similarities, uh, how much of the transnational uh, uh, groups, uh, they have the ingress, or it, obviously, ideologically, they do, but then how much actual physical ingress? So what problem that we, uh, countries like um, you know Pakistan and many other countries in the region, in Southeast Asia also, uh, Within, within, the only thing that is important to see is not to 
focusing too much on the outside, but then the linkages, uh, linkages and the nexuses that these locals, they manage to uh, create with the groups, uh, outside groups. And then of course, terminology, localizing the term. Then the one national narrative I've already said um, is problematic. Um, while one national idea about um, uh, dealing with extremism and terrorism, of course, there is no question about that. What is your objective? Obviously, you don't tolerate those things. But then how do you do it in a diverse country with diverse communities? When you have diversity, you have to have diverse, multiple um, messaging that uh, you require and narratives also. Finally, one question that uh, you very slightly, um, I think, touch, <laughs> but I wanted a uh, response uh, from your side. And then uh, I, I think in Q&A, uh, you can also talk about it. It's the gender thing. Uh, so gendered, and I'm not talking about women, but gendered approach. So whether, how do we deal with when women are part of that, um, uh, you know, program, uh, men, <laughs> So talking about the youth, the young female and male, I mean, they, they, all of them, they have different, when we try to study their behaviors, uh, their motivations, and then of course, I mean, we try to see it, uh, it's a very black and white uh, sort of a thing. So women can always be a victim or maybe a caregiver. Uh, so a mother who can help in the right. What about willingly if she was a perpetrator or part of that? Is it that kind of thing going on in the society or not? Similarly, boys, um, young boys and girls, and then um, uh, men. So this is something that we need to really see when we talk about it. We cannot really have a one size fit uh, all uh, solution. Um, so I think, uh, and then uh, just last uh, uh, point on your um, um, uh, this uh, the thing that you mentioned in some of the uh, recommendations, um, or in concluding uh, concluding uh, remarks in your conclusion, prevention versus disengagement uh, you mentioned, but then prevention is um, I mean how why we are even um, sort of uh, comparing them or uh, why we are even thinking about it because disengagement is in the domain of the uh, in, in city domain so it's a counter terrorism. Uh, somebody who is already being um, part of something radicalized um, or indoctrinated, and we are trying to uh, obviously coming up with something. It's a still a kind of a hard approach in many of the countries, this engagement process. Prevention is about everyday life. It's a very normal process. So while we are talking about prevention, we are talking about a normal governance in a society everyday political process that happens or a uh, governance that happens. Similarly, um, nonviolent um, extremism, uh, you said that um, uh, there was this another point about uh, uh, violent extremism, the difference between uh, non, how, how to differentiate between nonviolent extremism and violent extremism. So I think nonviolent extremism, um, it's something which is which is still um, where you don't really apply the CT, which does not come within the framework of CT. It's it's just, it's just a preventive uh, thing that you focus. And violent extremism is already declared groups who have used violence. So you're already dealing with them with CT. I mean, if the group is there using violence, declaring itself as a violent group, then the action that you are taking is already within the framework of CT. How would you, uh, how would you really address those issues using the CVE or uh, not CVE, but preventing PCVE um, when they're already sort of declared and categorized as the group um, which is um, uh, which is which is using violence. So, um, uh, and I just wanted to uh, have your response uh, because I, uh, yeah, I think we'll have a session on that. So I would just uh, finish that. I don't want to go on and on uh, that, but I'd love to. Dr. Joshua, if you want to have the privilege of 
responding to that yeah. uh, very briefly, and yeah. then we'll move on to question and answer session. I think the the violent versus nonviolent extremism. What what I was driving at was. Uh, at what point do you declare people problematic who may or may not be engaged with a network? I mean, we see uh, in all over the world, but in certainly in Southeast Asia and all over in, in North America and Europe, we see people engaged in extremist activities that hasn't crossed the line into violence, but they're not they're not connected to a network, right? So then you're you're not applying you're you're not applying CT approaches to them because they haven't done anything, but they're still engaging in behavior that might lead to violence or that might inspire others to commit violence. So I guess my question was, at what point do you, de this line between violent and nonviolent extremism, do you declare somebody is somebody problematic in the eyes of the law? And I guess some countries deal with this through hate speech. Right to say that there's actually a limit. There's actually a limit to what you can say. That you can't, you know, you you can you can express your views and opinions on things up to a certain point, but past that point, you're engaging in hate speech, which subjects which subjects you to the law in a certain way. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Somebody using hate speech and not indulging in right. violent activity. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a political question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the gender thing is uh, is interesting, and in, in this certainly in the Southeast Asian context, I see it the gender question unfold a number of ways. For a while, there was talk of uh, women as sort of partners in uh, PVE and CVE, right? Is is the missing link in people? Like, so what happens when got when it, and it was all very gendered. In, in the sense that it was all about men, right? It was still all about men as the, as the perpetrators and women as the people keeping the families together. So when you send a man to jail for 50 years or something like that, then, you know, that's a, a, a household that doesn't have a, a father. And then, you know, what, what, what resources do, do women have? So there's that. The other context is women as perpetrators, and certainly with, with, with the whole, with, with, in the ISIL era, we've seen very much that women are perpetrators. Um, so I, I, at least in my observations, I've, I've seen the discussion of, of women, you know, the both um, in, in terms of the resilience uh, and, and also in terms of the, you know, uh, you know, that, that they can be um, perpetrators of violence too, which is, an interesting conversation in um, conservative patriarchal societies. Uh, yeah, it's you know absolutely. Yeah, and 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 I mean some of the most vicious ISIL uh, fighters, by most accounts, have been women, and who who will remain unrepentant um, in 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 their views. Um, the structure. I just wanted to touch very briefly. The structural violence thing is is interesting, and I like Galtung's work a lot. I think that works in in the context of um, ethno tribal or ethno religious insurgencies, where you have groups that are obviously aggrieved or subject to structural violence by the state based on membership in a certain group. A place like Indonesia, the problem is the people who are perpetrating the violence mostly aren't subject to structural violence. They're no more poor or dispossessed than than ninety percent of the people in society. So there's no, you know, and I, you know, you're trying to find patterns, high and low. Well, there's no connection to dispossession. They're not more poor. Most, many of them are educated. Uh, so it does. It doesn't fit that sort of pattern of dispossession leading to. But I agree that that certainly in 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 South Asia, I, there's absolutely uh, a, a, a context to that. In Sri Lanka, yeah. there's absolutely a context. I spent a year in Colombo, uh, in twenty something, twenty th twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen, and and the violence. 
being directed, uh, and I would call it structural violence being directed by the Sri Lankan state against the Muslim community, not the Tamils. I, I, against Sri Lanka's Muslim community, right? Banning halal food, yeah. you know, these sorts of just kind of insulting and silly policy measures that was yeah. it, it, it tantamount to structural violence. Sorry, actually creating an enemy. So the, that's an interesting case of that, yeah. Well, I'm certainly eager to ask a question, but I'll yeah. mark my question okay. right now. And I would have the pleasure of, uh, you know, indulging our respected audience and guests out here. Over to you, Ambassador Dharani, for the first question. Thank you, Dr. Joshua. Uh, uh, I stand educated uh, with your enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, having dealt with multilateralism and uh, so called terrorism, whose definition is yet to be agreed upon at the UN system. It appears that uh, whatever we are talking about, we are talking about the post 9-11 scenario under which the United States declared either you are with us or against us. And from that flows everything, whether it is violent extremism or it is counterterrorism. And if you look at the UN system, it has been applied selectively. 1267 committee, Taliban are banned, and with the same Taliban, then they negotiate, and they shake hand, and then they uh, sign an agreement, and they withdraw. But uh, the same Afghanistan before 9-11, and when the Soviet troops entered Afghanistan, the same Mujahideen, they were declared as moral equivalent of our forefathers. Yes? So it means there's a, you know, double speak. And it is actually the powerful which is dictating its terms and they are applying certain terminologies upon the countries who may not perhaps draw their lines. I hope uh, you would, or uh, hopefully in future, you look to this aspect of the violent extremism and terrorism. Reason being why I'm saying this is that it has created a divide Clear divide and leading this world to a renewed Cold War. Um, we talk about Rohingyas. We are silent about what is happening in Indian held Kashmir, where 100,000 people have been killed in the name of whatever the occupation is there. But no one is talking about the human rights. But we Muslims then we become very soft and we are, you know, our hearts bleed for them. What has happened to this violent extremism? And we are the moral, uh, the, the champions of uh, morality, counter-terrorism, promotion uh, 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 of uh, violent extremism, where are they? So this is the, I think the, the jury is still out and I think there is a lot of work which needs to be done. and many duplicitous concepts and cherry picking has to be done away with. Your take, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, th th there's certainly no shortage of double standards in the international system, right? Th th there's certainly no sh shortage of, of uh, great power hegemony uh, in, in, in the way that that things unfold uh and it's certainly not just or fair i don't i i i don't you know pe people's hearts bleed for the uyghurs but i don't see so much action on that front i mean i see a lot of states remaining quite silent on on the Uyghur issue uh because everybody wants good trade relations with china right so so on that um the multilateral issue is is on terror is, uh, terrorism issues and extremist issues is is very interesting. And in Southeast Asia, going back to the sort of theme of my presentation, there's no there's no consensus within uh, Southeast Asia on some of the issues, right? So uh, the insurgency in the south of Thailand has been going on for a very long time. 
Um, the official position of the Malaysian government has been hands off. There are people within the Malaysian government who at various times have given unofficial support to uh, people on the uh, on 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 the Thai side of the border. So there's the, so the the CT cooperation between Thailand and Malaysia in terms of the south issue has not been very good. Um, that's sort of a, a well established fact. Uh, the Rohingya issue in Southeast Asia, states see it very differently. Malaysia and Indonesia see the Rohingya issue in a particular way. Uh, they, they wanted ASEAN to take a very hard approach with Myanmar. Um, Thailand and Singapore, for their own reasons, not so much. So multilateralism and, 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 and finding sort of multilateral solutions to these issues at a, at, at a regional level is, um, is, is certainly very complicated. Uh, the issues that I'm talking about, that I talked about today, predate 9-11. Right. These are structural issues. The, in, in, if you look at the insurgency in the south of Thailand and the south of the Philippines, these have been going on since the 1960s. Right. Indonesia has, has, had, has had groups challenging the state using a certain ideological discourse since 1948. Since the birth of the state, there have been groups that have been used a certain ideological discourse to challenge the state because their version of the state didn't win. And it's taken various manifestations over the generations. You can draw a, sort of a, a link, a DNA chain from that movement in 1947 or in the pre-colonial era to movements functioning today. So th th that's my only, but you're, you're certainly right in terms of the post 9-11 dynamics and, and, and some of the division that it causes. I mean, uh, Don makes up uh, data moments with the violent extremism, because what happened in Aceh, what happened in uh, the Timorist, uh, that was different. Yeah, I'm not talking uh, about that. Same is the case with Moro Muslims and other, uh, you know. Uh, I'm talking, referring to this violent activism, uh, extremism, which in fact killed half a million people in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. half a million people in uh, uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. in the name of finding weapons of mass destruction, which people right. could not find. And which category would you place that violence against the people? And where would we draw a line? Well, the U.S.-led war on terror was a disaster. So where? I, I'm not. I'm not contesting that. What, what, what about the jury? I think, sir, uh, uh, it's a very valid point, but uh, uh, that's the realm of hegemony that we are dealing, and uh, the same thing is at play in India in the shape of Hindutva. So that's a, entirely a different topic. So I would like to uh, basically take you back to your discourse. Uh, Terrorism is a phenomenon that is not uh, amenable to place both solutions. It's a multivariate phenomenon. And two aspects that you highlighted, one was uh, prevention part, and second was curative part. Now, uh, prevention is uh, a prophylaxis. So how do we achieve that? To me, it is a political uh, a, you know, strategy that takes care of that. While the curative thing is, uh, taken care of through governance. We know that in totalitarian states, uh, the counter-terrorism apparatus is very, very strong, right from the times of assassins, you know, uh, uh, and uh, anarchists in the time of uh, Russian czars. The states which were strong, their response was very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very active and vigorous. So they were less predisposed to this uh, Malays, but the states uh, which have uh, democratic freedoms, so those things are exploited by these non-state actors. So the curative part is more about governance, how strong your laws are, because uh, uh, it's a crime with an ideology. So the, there is no single definition, but the one one definition that resonates with me is it is a propaganda by deed. So 
how do you stop that propaganda by deed is through strong state actions we uh, woke up to this reality after uh, our defining moment in uh, aps peshawar massacre the entire state came up to the response there's a 20 point uh, asian down national action plan why it is not being implemented is a question of governance Governance includes laws, how you implement, how you're policing, how your country has a structure. Prevention and prophylaxis is in the realm of structural violence that you spoke of, uh, John Carl Pung's part. So, uh, how, my question is that how would that aspect be taken? Prophylaxis, prevention. For prevention, we need to map out the grievances. So, there's a very far away in uh, you know, mosaic that we have. At the end of the country, there is a second nationalism, sub nationalism. At the end of the country, there is an entity like TTP, which has an ideology that does not uh, respond to any reason. And uh, at some places, people come in the proxy warfare. And there were 87 uh, uh, active camps. This thing against Pakistan, 21 on uh, our eastern border, 66 on our western border. So is there a way that we can map these grievances and we come up with an amelioration index, like a gene coefficient? Uh, th th that's the $2 million question, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that's um, very complicated indeed. I think that uh, in, in certain context, understanding the nature of grievance is more linear uh, or simple than in others. And in some cases, we we have multiple trajectories of grievance, right? Um, so it's, it, it, it's, it's an easier task if you have extremism, whatever label we, we want to use, uh, stemming from feelings of dispossession or lack of inclusion or grievance that uh you know we didn't get our state right subnationalism um that's a particular type of grievance that can be engaged with politically in a certain way if there's a will uh that's one thing and in southeast asia we we certainly we have that right in in the south of thailand and the south of the philippines the the creation of states and the and the map line uh, didn't work very well <laughs> to, to to make a very long story short it did you know you had people the the line should have been sort of drawn two degrees south or something like that but that but but that wasn't the way it happened so there's grievance and then there's 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 expressions of of rage associated with this grievance and the, the, and then the decisions to take up arms against the state. And terror is used as a tactic within that context, right? So the Abu Sayyaf group is part of a larger ecosystem of groups fighting the Philippine state. They see themselves as freedom fighters, right? But they engage in terror tactics by any objective definition of whether of what it is. Now, do we do do we agree? about uh, that they should have independence that's a whole other question right so there's that then there are people within the state of indonesia itself who adopt an ideology and based on that ideology make a decision to engage in violent activism well the, that's the, the the grievance there is completely different it's not based on subnationalism it's based on objecting to the ideological parameters of the state itself and wanting to be part of a movement that replaces one type of experiment with another by force. That's what they want. So it's easier to address the first thing than the second thing, right? The first thing is about political will and negotiation and, and ultimately like Northern Ireland, right? Ultimately coming to some sort of negotiated settlement if you've got kind of wise leadership on both sides. The other, is an existential threat, potentially, right? The other, so how you do prevention in the context of the second one is really difficult because who are you targeting? Who are you direct? And that's a political decision. That's political, right? Somebody has to make that decision. 
right? Are you targeting young men between 18 and 25? Are you tar targeting people who uh, identify as being overtly religious in a certain way? Are you targeting people whose social media uh, uh, you know, engagement looks a certain way, people who look at certain websites. On what basis do you make the decision? What criteria? And I don't have any answers <laughs> uh, to that one, but but it's a question social scientists working on this certain, certainly ask. It's very, it's very complicated indeed. I would argue that that the, the sub-nationalism one is probably easier to address than the other. Do you have... Now I will request uh, intellectually stimulating and ever jovial Mr. Akmekri to ask his question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. It was a very enlightening discourse and you very promptly reflected on three major countries of the region, that is Malaysia, um, Indonesia, as well as the Philippines. There is one more country in the region, and that is Myanmar. I would like to uh, touch base upon it by saying how structural violence on the part of the state itself the military junta again so more, more than a dozen countries in 2021 had formally stated that it needs to be contained but nothing has been done as dr arshi has also stated it has also excluded the political process that was underway the popular political participation is now no more so would you like to show some light on this this kind of structural violence that of course has a snowball reaction in the region elsewhere as well because a particular community a particular audience is being targeted your experience on that the the, the, the rohingya situation is, is 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 very tragic i know people working for for iom and unhcr who are working in cox's bazaar right now and i've you know and i've supervised uh, numerous theses of people who have gone and done field work there and it's uh, uh, you know one of the crimes of the of of the 21st century indeed um but it, 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 this didn't happen overnight, right? This is a there was a slow burn on the part of the of the Burmese or Myanmar government leading up to this sort of final solution in in terms of the forced deportations and the violence, right? This the, the this begins a long time ago with this sort of summary dispossession of people's rights, very insidious and nasty stuff where they they asked you know they they said to people where we're, we're going to replace your id cards now keep in mind that this population has a very low rate of literacy if you talk to people who who work in activism in the ngo sphere they say like the 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 rohingya aren't easy because they're not sophisticated people right they're sort of peasants in the true sense very low rates of literacy um so when people tell them things, when leaders tell them things, they believe them. And at one point, the government said, show up here, 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 and here. Bring all your documents. We're going to modernize your ID card. What did they do? They destroyed them. Right? So that was the beginning. And this affected hundreds of thousands of people. This is documented, right? Um, so th there was, there's been an organized campaign on the part of the Burmese government going back decades to dispossess the Rohingya. So that's one thing. The other thing is geopolitics, right? Like so much like with, with, with the dynamics you're referring to, right? Realpolitik, geopolitics plays a role here, right? The West has no leverage. Western states uh, cry crocodile tears for the, for the Rohingya, as, as we all should, but they have no leverage with the, with the junta. None, right? You have leverage by engaging, and the West made a decision based on human rights factors to sort of castigate Myanmar a long time ago, and in so doing, created an opening for China and India. So China and India now have the leverage with Myanmar. So if there's going to be if if there's going to be any uh, pressure put in terms of the regime the acting better towards the Rohingya people, it's not going to come through pressure from the West. It's going to come through pressure from uh, Beijing or New Delhi. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 ter it's terrible. And interestingly enough, I mean, all of my years spent in Malaysia, I met many Rohingya and they don't want to be resettled. One of the only refugee groups I've met who doesn't want to be resettled in the West, they want to go home. So in fact, they want to stay as close to home as possible for the time that they can actually go home. 
So that, that, that makes it even more sad. In many cases, they're all they're offered resettlement. They say, you know, we, we've got, we, you know, you can go to the States, Canada, Australia. They say, no, 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 we'll stay here. Thank you. Because it's closer. Because one day we might be able to go back. Very, very sad stuff. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Urshi, your uh, comment. Yeah. Okay. I think such questions, um, uh, they become important because um, post 9-11, this um, redefining the security um, um, paradigm that we, um, and the redefined security paradigm that we have now, don't you think that it has made it easy for the states on part of the Myanmar uh, government uh, to ask certain, certain things to make it more difficult or to make, to take um, more hard uh, steps against the people it would have been a different situation had there been, um, you know, a different security paradigm the way it was like pre 9-11. The kind of leverage that states got to take action, because mm -hmm. it's not just that the state was taking action in on the, uh, you know, on the context of that these are the people who are not really following the state's um, um, you know, guidelines or the things that they are supposed to do, but they are the ones who have the potential to join extremist groups also. There have been um, yeah. the, uh, other influences. Yeah. So the uh, Myanmar uh, government actually sort of rationalized or justified its um, actions, not on the pretext that this community is not really following what the state is supposed to do, but because they have the information or the knowledge that certain extremist groups have been um, uh, sort of uh, influencing the mind so you're saying and, uh, doing that. So I think they securitize them. Securitizing. And securitizing within that post 9-11 redefined security paradigm. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is how I see that many places, right. uh, they got a leverage also, um, sure. or it became more easier for them to sort of take action in the name of security, yes. in the name of dealing with certain groups who may have certain influences um, by the uh, extremist groups. How much of that influence is there on Rohingya? That is something that we have to study and see. How much is the ingress is there? But certainly it did help the Myanmar government to take uh, action against them. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's an interesting comment. But then I think at the same time, uh, the structural factor certainly cannot be divorced uh, from the fact that in Myanmar's very constitution, where you have different ethnic identities that are acknowledged therein, Rohingyas, and you know, people in Rakhine are certainly not there. So that's one certain factor that kind of you know takes away their own uh, identity and the acknowledgement of their own existence within Myanmar. Now we move on to our next two questions. I will ask uh, Wakas and Dr. Shamsa to ask their questions. Thank you, Sana. My name is Vokas Chan, and I'm still very much a student of international relations. Uh, my question is to the panel as a whole, and uh, I think uh, this is related to what we just mentioned as well, and also about what, uh, what Dr. Josh uh, uh, talked about in terms of ownership. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but you mentioned something along the lines that in Indonesia, uh, first they were focusing on CT aspects, and oh, sorry, first they were uh, the, the the NGOs that were focusing on CVE were basically more Western dominated. And then overnight, someone got the memo in the government that, look, we need to own this and that. My question is, how did that happen? That doesn't happen overnight, I would say. Or if it did, then what factors led to that decision of the Indonesian government finally taking ownership of something it felt was a prior, uh, was something that was important? For example, uh, I mean, it's related to, I mean, what has got to give for states to take action, be it kinetic or be it uh, fixing such structural changes. I mean, in Pakistan, we had the APS attack and that sort of jolted the whole nation into basically rallying towards uh, not just military support, but actually sort of acting as a binding force to just battle the scourge of terrorism before it got out of hand. So that's for the, that's for the kinetic aspect. But what has got to give for a state to then re-recognize, or not just perhaps recognize, but just sort of try perhaps this approach that maybe there needs to be a more different thought of approach to uh, to addressing this issue from from its roots? 
like you mentioned. Thanks. Well, in, I think in, in the Indonesian context, it, 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 you can trace this regionally. In the, in the, in the Indonesian context, a, a few things happened. Um, the country got wealthier. So the, the economy started to do better. So the, the, and with that came uh, a sense that we're a, a, a burgeoning middle-income country right? We're the world's most populous Muslim country. A sense of national, a sense of nationalism or a, a renewed sense of nationalism, a renewed sense of national confidence, right? Uh, at, at a certain period of time. Uh, and I, I think I, at the same time, um, the sense that uh, extremism is a, was a domestic political problem, Right, as opposed to it being a foreign issue, uh, that it was actually a domestic problem. And I believe, on a very practical level, I think there were interactions, as as I as I understand, between sort of a triangulation between Western governments, big Western NGOs, and the Indonesian state at various levels, where somebody just looked into it. Right. Yeah. Keep in mind that for a long period of time, the focus was just CT, the Indonesian government. I mean, they didn't even run in prison programs. Everything was outsourced. All the capacity was outsourced to foreign NGOs. Um, and I think at some point they woke up to the to the extent of this. And I don't know what particular interaction it was, but there was something that happened because all of a sudden there was a movement, a move to regulate foreign NGOs generally and to particularly regulate the the operations of foreign NGOs operating in the PCVE space specifically. And as I said, they made they made uh, civil society groups kind of choose. They, they said, we're not going to ban you, we're not going to outlaw you, but if you want to cooperate with the state, you can't get money from, from mom and dad. <laughs> you, you, you have to pick. Pick your paymaster, right? And the challenge was for the NGOs that the Western paymaster was, you know, people were making serious money off of these programs. And I didn't get into that today, but there's definitely, you know, the, the concept of marketization. There's definitely a marketization of CVE. It definitely, and I saw, I even see it with like individuals branding themselves as like CVE experts, consultants, this whole world, right? People making like money doing this and you you were talking about the the ends of the program and from what i observed the end was how much money <laughs> can we can, can, can we extract from the and then how do we get more money how do we show that we've done enough that, and then we can go back to the to the donors and say okay we've done this much now we just need another half a million and, and another half you, you know what i mean so i so walk us i don't know exactly what it was, but I, I'd say there were three things, three movements kind of operating at the same time. And across the region, there's also been moves to regulate or curtail the activities of foreign NGOs uh, in Thailand, definitely, and in the Philippines, absolutely. Some people attribute this, and you can look at this a number of different ways, right? Uh, for the human rights and democracy crowd, they see this as like a net erosion of rights. They see this as a sort of creeping authoritarianism, um, but not everybody sees it that way. Other people say, well, listen, the foreign NGOs were, you know, uh, circumventing the state. There was no regulation. Uh, something had to be done, you know, foreign NGOs, can operate in Canada or the United States with the freedom that those same NGOs were operating here. So come on, you know, fair is fair. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, ma'am, yeah. please. And, and then I'll go back to the, the, the response that I gave on uh, the earlier question. Because it was post 9-11, um, the way, uh, I mean, there was this overwhelming uh, sort of um, uh, feeling that um, because we have take we have to take action and we are part of war on terror. Uh, uh, obviously, U.S. leading it, and then the other countries. So all those different countries where which were uh, vulnerable to extremist ideas and where action had to be taken 
a lot of ngos absolutely they obviously started and there was initially it was uh, even our case is similar to an extent that we had to come up with certain regulation as well after a while um but why it happened why states had to really see that something is not right perhaps it may not be to that extent but something is not right. i think it was perhaps the reaction within people started thinking that the kind of um, you know uh, these ngos are uh, sort of facilitating the us and mm. the uh, other countries um uh, you know in capturing or arresting people or identifying people when initially in different countries people started and i'm, I'm not talking about uh, those known uh, figures or leaders within the organizations but people who uh, might have been affiliated or uh, you know there were some uh, uh, indications so the common people in society uh, you know they started reacting to the fact that perhaps these are the foreign ngos who are facilitating and uh, identifying or helping um the us perhaps um uh, to take action against them um and that mm-hmm. reaction also led to, i mean it's, it's it could be both ways in different countries it's not always necessary that just because uh, uh, they were making too much money so the state uh, just thought that uh, perhaps, uh, there's too much free money coming and we have to rein them in but there was a re- reaction also in in country when it was in south asia i can certainly say that. there was a lot of money flowing at one point yeah. a lot yeah. And and not just from the states too, you know, yeah. from, from Western countries. Western countries. For yeah. Shamsa, uh, your uh, very incisive discourse has forced me to uh, make a request prior to asking you a question. That was to please write for our journal as <laughs> being a, um, an editor of a journal at IPRI. I mean, this is my privilege that I'm meeting you here. and making a personal request to write for our for journal having said that i mean you talked about the root causes of uh, extremism and i was thinking when it took me back to the times when i worked on radicalizing de radicalizing pakistan and how could we do that and this was an assignment given to me by my earlier employees uh i was reading sageman and in that i discovered that he had identified three causes of radicalization fear anger and identity now taking the lead from there when i go into uh, extremism i find that and your suggestion allow me to relate it with your suggestion that you uh, suggested that we should be involving the Uh, uh psychologists and uh, prior to involving the psychologists and working on while working on preventive measures we should be also thinking about the information environment which we can create for the people at different levels and uh, when i was uh, doing this research on uh, radicalizing pakistan at this i interviewed students from madrasas from various strata of schools and i thought that how can we improve the information environment when history is being used as an instrument right whether it is a political instrument or a religious instrument or a cultural instrument for that matter so don't you think that the historians should also be you know involved in uh, a more cordial history of, to be written really interesting point um uh, you know the the radicalization question is is a call very complicated one and and sageman is 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 probably right and and there there are debates at least in the in the context that I've worked in between this sort of the the extent to which this is um psychological or this is ideological I've done my fair share of interviews I've I've interviewed Abu Bakr Bashir the guy in the in 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 the picture um i had to pay to interview him it wasn't cheap 
he had a he had a little industry going, and the Indonesian government allowed it, so I paid a certain amount of money, and I, I I was able to talk to him for a little while, and he it was like he was scripted. It was like from central casting in Hollywood. He gave me all the all the answers I wanted to hear, and it was like you know thank you, thank you next. Um, what the 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 relationship between uh, sort of psychological malady and ideology is is a complicated one and i suspect that you, you need some combination of the two right uh you need some combination of of <clears throat> addressing the sort of dispossession and i i think there are multiple paths that lead people into this life right there's a, a guy at georgetown uh mokadam who, who developed a staircase model, if you've seen that, right, to say that, you know, there's sort of a, 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 a staircase to violent activism, and not everybody who starts on the, on the flight of stairs arrives at the top. Um, some people might, you know, you know stop at the, the second step or third step. Um, so for the people who reach the very top and start to engage in violent activism, I think there are multiple paths that, that lead to that, right? In some cases, it's psychological vulnerability. In some cases, it's indoctrination. Um, it's, it's not the case that everybody who gets radicalized is psychologically weak. Uh, so I don't know if a one-size-fits-all approach works or if you need some kind of triage system, some kind of assessment system to figure out with the individual what's going on, and then based on that, you know, um, sort of uh, send them to to the you know theological stream to get better religious education to correct incorrect views, or you send them to the psychiatrist to talk about their childhood, right, and why they didn't bond with their parents, right? If that's the if that's the source of why they why they're angry, um, so for, I don't know if we can say conclusively. But there probably has to be some combination of the two. The role of history and narrative is really powerful. And I think people who uh, get involved with certain types of movements, one of the things that happens is they, they live in their own echo chamber of, of information and what they hear. And this is true in the United States for, for white nationalists. For the guys who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, this is true in Indonesia. This is true in, in multiple places. When people become part, part of these movements, they, uh, they make decisions about the world and how they see the world. And in so doing, they're not consulting <laughs> multiple news sources to, uh, to check their own opinions on things, right? A lot, a lot of the people who get involved in these movements want simple answers to the world, right? They want, not that they're stupid people necessarily, but they want simple answers and they get them. And that's very appealing. And I think that's something that a lot of, a lot of extremist movements, regardless of the ideology have in common, that they give people kind of neat answers to complex problems and controlling and, and, and giving people a, a consistent and simple narrative about the world and whose fault everything is, is very powerful in sort of uh, shaping the mind. Um, the former president of Indonesia, uh, a guy they called uh, Gustur Abdurrahman Wahid, a uh, blind fellow, pr probably some yeah. of you would know if you've seen yeah. the picture. He wrote an op-ed in one of the Australian um, uh, newspapers. This is years and years ago now. And he was making a plea for young Indonesians to study the social sciences and humanities. He said, not to people who have engineering backgrounds here, not to, not to <laughs> disengineer social sciences, because that's so vitally important, we need them. But he said, part of the problem is a lot of people who get into these movements come from disciplines where, where they're given answers. They're given answers. They're not taught complexity, exactly. right? They're not taught that there are some we have to accept difference and we have to accept that we can both be right without me being right and you being wrong. So he was making a plea for young Indonesians, don't do that engineering degree, study history, study political science, 
And as a political scientist myself, I thought, oh, isn't that, isn't that great? But he made a really interesting point about, about this sort of in, about information and narrative, right? And the more sophisticated people are, you know, maybe that's a way to, uh, to thwart it. But there's a, there's a disproportionate number of people, at least in Southeast Asia, who are educated in these movements who have STEM and engineering backgrounds. And people have done the research on this. They've actually mm. crunched the data of detainees who have degrees and they say, what did you study? Then they go person by person and then they, and then they quantify it. So that, that was an interesting, but the, the, power, the power of narrative, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I think that's really a very interesting point that you brought about the power of narrative. Um, use this, thanks, sir. So about, about the building on that, um, well, what we see right now, I think you touched upon this briefly as well, the power of social media as well. It sort of compounds this push towards for a narrative that is both uh, dangerous and, and weaponized and specifically targeted to that audience, like you mentioned, ownership and target. So in order to counter that, for example, just to counter that on the, on the digital space or the information domain, who takes ownership of that? is the best person to basically come out and say no this is wrong and this is the alternate or to basically just present something and as as an alternate without even perhaps engaging with the other so how do you counter that in terms of both its effect and also in terms of its magnitude i would ask um well there's an example now it's easy to be cynical about some of the, the, these programs in 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 their effect um, the, but I'll give you an example of of a, of a, uh, a current agenda. So the, the the UAE currently funds a center called Sawab, which is uh, about anti ISIL or Daesh um, narratives. They have a physical facility. It's run in conjunction with with, with the US, probably a three letter agency, um, and they they do they employ people. It's a building, it's four or five floors. They've got, they've got people and all day, every day, they're doing counter narratives in Arabic online directed at the Arab world. And that's what they do all day, 20 day, they do two 12 hour shifts. They employ lots and of people. Well, it, they don't, well, I don't know because I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't have access to that organization, but that would be interesting. And, and that's a whole other question is about measuring effectiveness. Mm -hmm. but, but, but it's an example of you were talking about that, that there are, there are actors who are taking narrative seriously and are using resources to try to put serious resources, it's not cheap to run this sort of outfit, uh, to try to put counter narratives out there. The thing is, these extremist movements are very sophisticated in the way that, in, in the way they, they, uh, communicate themselves, and if there's what I see, if there's any whiff of any connection to the West, they immediately the counter narratives lose their uh, potency. With because who are you trying to reach? Right, you're all you're trying to reach people who already see the world a certain way. Right, you're 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 targeting people who are already not positively disposed to certain types of ideas. So not people who are totally radicalized and, and sort of mobilized towards violence, but people who are hardening in their worldview. If these people find out that, that, that something is a joint venture between something and a Western government, and me, I would imagine, <laughs> immediately it's going to lose any credibility. Because specifically who? Do you want celebrities, sports stars, politicians? Multiple, people, um, uh, multiple. Yeah, multiple. multiple. Yeah. I mean, when we say society or uh, people who are uh, given this um, sort of, uh, I mean, I would not use the word task, but they are engaged. I mean, they're part of that. So if it is a part of the cultural um, side of that, that you have to really um, sort of um, uh, reinforce or reclaim your culture, yeah. I, mean, I would say that. So it's like reclaiming your values that you think that in 10, 20 or 30 years, because of those um, um, extremist ideas, they are um, affected. So reclaiming those values. So if we are, we have to talk about in our context, so we would, obviously we have not been like, uh, I mean, these people, uh, we, we have not, been, our society has not been like that, what we have experienced in the last 20, 30, 40 years. 
So what are those things? So it's like reclaiming our own uh, society. So it could be different in Indonesia or in uh, Philippines or right. in case of and, Pakistan. Uh, and interestingly on that, it's different in the context of extremism within Muslim communities in minority settings. Yeah, right? yeah. In, the, in the UK, yeah. there was a disastrous campaign a disastrous, and, and, and I've got British Muslim friends who said they were of school age and they were made to attend assemblies mm. on like de-radicalization. And how did they pick mm. who attended? Yeah. Beard, yeah. good job, assembly now. Yeah. And they said it was the most demeaning. Absolutely. And it's and it's it's totally counterproductive, totally counterproductive. And that made them, I, I don't know if there's any relationship between that and people becoming interested in extremism, but it made them feel even less connected to the British state. It's like I felt, you know, securitized <laughs> because I was forced to attend this. So it's very difficult to do this messaging in a way that you're also not patronizing people. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. So what happened in UK, the coin and other, um, you know, um, counterterrorism st strategies, I mean, the way Muslim community was targeted, um, not everybody was uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, having that uh, extremist yeah. ideas or influenced by that. But if they had started wearing in a certain yes. way or the boys had started uh, growing beard and all that. So what what actually happened there? This this really, in fact, it increased the number of people who actually started visiting those, uh, uh, those uh, not madrasas, but those uh, lectures and uh, places yes. where um, a scholar, Islamic scholar. And then from there on, we, see, we saw in 10, 20, uh, last 10, 20 years, yeah. uh, more people from the community in UK uh, join right certain and and the thing is the other side knows this right yeah. the the, yeah. the 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 people running the these networks who have an agenda know yeah. that they're dealing yeah. with vulnerable communities exactly. of people who who feel dispossessed and then yeah. they target their messaging to yeah. that to say you know you know you're not really welcome in this country right you know you're not really british or you're not really australian or canadian yeah. you know? You have a different identity and off to the races as it and, uh, then we talk of the technology so this social media alternate reality has taken over uh, information landscape <clears throat> we mentioned uk uh, what happened in leicester leicester show yeah so there were uh, 0.2 million tweets all fueling uh hatred and uh those tweets were all uh, generated from Equality Lab, one of the monitors, Dalit based monitoring. Uh, they have physically uh, crunched the data mm -hmm. and they came up with the conclusion that those two lakh tweets they emanated from uh, India. And in Leicester, uh, those uh, communities which were uh, hitherto for uh, quite, uh, you know, Emmy. There was a uh, interfaith harmony, and there was no yeah, such so it fueled uh, mm -hmm. violent extremism. Yeah, we see in India, uh, Adani is a billionaire, Indian billionaire. Yes. I think, uh, one of the oh, yeah, he was yeah. Yeah, in, so he has bought NDTV. Before that, we know Reliance has uh, Ambani's Reliance has bought two channels. The link between uh, corporate mercantilism and uh, RSS has ensured that the information mm -hmm. landscape of India is completely emasculated. Yeah, sure. So there is no contrarian view. Social media is also being regulated. Uh, it's a kind of an information lockup. Mm -hmm. So how is uh, a country in this age where social media can we say cannot be regulated? Before? And uh, if social media use has become such a big menace, do you have some lessons for countries like Pakistan who could be right here? You know, that's well, it, it, yeah, it, 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 it's a very important question. And, and it's one of the sort of, I think, central questions of our age, I think, everywhere, right? Um, I'm, uh, social media is not my area of expertise. I guess I would say that like, there's a generation gap 
right? Uh, I mean, I, I don't have children, but friends even my age who have kids uh, and my friends are reasonably digitally aware, their kids are so much further ahead, right? Digital natives. And I find that, you know, kids, I call them people in their 20s are just uh, miles and miles ahead of me. So I think that, that the information environment has to be addressed in, in and through education, right? Children are consumers of information. And if we have responsible education systems, uh, we teach kids at a young age to be savvy, uh, savvy consumers of information, right? Teaching research skills, teaching critical thought, not rote learning, yeah. right? So shifting from education systems based on memorizing stuff to actually thinking. These are all tools that I think can help young people sort of sort through the minefield that is social media, right? Parents trying to keep their kids away from social media, uh, you know, uh, until they hit a certain age. So they actually experience something different and maybe don't develop the, the addiction as early. I, you know, I don't know. But when information gets weaponized in the context of, of uh, you know, India, or you look at the sort of rise of right wing media in the United States, um, it's different and it gets all, it gets all the harder to find good information and not be sort of seduced by misinformation or, uh, you know, and, 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 and the like. Uh, so that's a structural issue, right. In, 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 in India or in the U S the sort of power of conservative media, I guess the most we can do is try to teach kids to be better consumers of information. Um, and, uh, you know, use critical thinking right because we're not going to change india's information environment from here right we're not going to change um fox the sort of penetration of fox news from here the only thing we can do as consumers as see as have our you know uh bs radar you know and and go from there yeah um so before we take uh the last question, I'll just intervene. I'll table a question first, uh, which I've held for quite some long time. Uh, from a psychological perspective of individuals, you know, that have either been radicalized or have engaged in, you know, extremist uh, violence, do you think structural factors are functioning as an enabling factor towards what you call as recidivism among militants that are undergoing rehabilitation? Have you also found any strong correlation between rank or past history of violence among individuals that are undergoing rehabilitation, uh, particularly during their prison time or in any other facility? Um, there's definitely a correlation between people with a propensity to use violence generally and people who, once they get into these movements, become willing to use violence. Uh, there's been quite a bit of research in the Southeast Asian context done on that. And they, 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 say, they say that in terms of who climbs the stairs, the person you, you want to be most concerned about is the person who um, isn't necessarily the most ideologically aware, but the person who's a thug, right? And, and, and the person who's not everybody is capable of applying violence, right? It's, a, it, it's not, you know, uh, so everybody I talk to and in my experience that th there's definitely that um the sort of crime terror nexus is also very real right the sort of uh interlinkage between um formal and semi-formal crime groups and extremist groups uh in Indonesia that's absolutely a thing there are you know yeah rent a thug organizations that 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 sort of have a nominal connection to Islamist ideology, but are really just for hire. Um, and the state hasn't dealt with those groups so effectively uh, for a number of reasons. The, 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 the pathologies on an individual level, um, the recidivism was a problem at a particular time. What I observed uh, was that there was no post-release support. So people would do time in prison. They were put through not very sophisticated and poorly run disengagement programs, like really bad, 
like not like not very good at all, run by people who didn't have either uh, a theological knowledge or psychological knowledge, right? Um, and then they get out, and society doesn't care about them, right? And the, Indo the Indonesian government for a long time, because it, it, there was a taboo around this, big taboo. Uh, so there was no reintegration plan. There, were the, the, there was nothing. People were left to themselves. Now, if you've been in an extremist network for a decade and you go to jail, when you get out of jail, who are you going to call? Your friends. And I think somebody finally, they were like, oh, that's a problem, right? So they had to confront that whether they liked it or not, whether there was a taboo around this or not, there needed to be some kind of, there needed to be support mechanisms for people who paid their debt to society, that it just, it wasn't good enough, a good enough response to sort of cast people out, right? Because in many cases, families would then reject these guys, right? You're not welcome back in the village. So it's about making a new life. So now there, there increasingly there are now NGOs that provide that sort of support, how successful they are. I don't know, but people are at least thinking about it, right? There are, there's a chain of cafes um, that employ these guys to give them work because good luck getting a job. Probably, I don't know if it's similar here, right? But good luck getting any kind of job if you've done time uh, for anything associated with extremism. Um, and the, the mind, I don't know, I, from what I've observed in the people I've talked to, Family and social networks, in terms of in-person networks, are very powerful. Um, I would say rather than mental deficiency or rather than anger, uh, I can't I tell you how many people I've talked to who said, well, my brother was in the movement. My cousin was in the movement. My neighbor. Uh, that... I think is the most powerful recruiting tool. And it's, it's, it's a pattern in many places where it tends to be. And then, and then whole families go in, right? And then, and then a militant or, or an extremist gets married off to the sister of another. And then you have, you know, multi-generational linkages between families and people have done like these kind of, you know, DNA chains studying how these, how these families are interlinked. That really shows the power of social connection in, in real life. Um, so, yeah. yeah, there's certainly no denying, you know, the power of socialization. And now with that, I move on uh, with our last question to Komal. And sorry, I had to jump the gun there. Go ahead. Uh, so my name is Komal and I'm the advocacy lead for Web3. Artificial intelligence is a fairly large part of Web3. So I was wondering if how, you know, how algorithms operate on um, artificial intelligence and that eventually leads to eco chambers. So is it time to start debating about holding AI liable in terms of being criminal and facilitating terrorism? Is it time to sort of switch lenses? Because we view technology from a security lens. Is it time to sort of view um, extremism and uh, violence from the lens of technology? Really, and listen, I can barely use my computer right i'm 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 getting i'm getting old <laughs> uh and so so you know ai is not my is not my thing so i i won't uh, but i agree my answer to your question is yes absolutely and we see going back to a model uh, an example outside of this part of the world at the united states right the january 6th uh, stuff the rise of white nationalism and the debate about the responsibility of big tech Right, where these, I mean, in my opinion, these companies are media companies. They're content companies, and they need to be regulated like media organizations are regulated, right? So a newspaper in most societies can't just print whatever it wants. It's subject to, even in societies with very strong freedom of expression, you know, uh, laws, uh, the, everything is subject to, to, to some sort of regulation, the rules of the road, right? You can't print a one page editorial, totally demonizing a group of people. You just can't do it, right? Um, but because these, because these platforms call themselves technology platforms and not, and not information platforms, they say, well, then we shouldn't be regulated. I totally disagree with that. And I think that Part of what's gone on is is, is there's also a, an, an an element of money and lobbying 
right? These companies are immensely wealthy and they're lobbying, they lobby Brussels, they lobby Washington, they lobby London uh, to keep the regulation, to keep the regulatory environment as minimal as possible, right? Um, and I think that's a, I think that's a huge problem. Um, and it's one that young people, in terms of activism, right? There's some activism is problematic, but some activism is good. And I think there should be, you know, young people should be pushing governments on this because th th this really is about your future. Uh, and, you know, the uh, allowing this sort of hate speech. And it's not just extremism, it's other forms of hate speech too, right? But that the, that the digital sphere has just become this sort of uh, soapbox where you can just say whatever. And in fact, if I walk on the street, I can't just say whatever, right? No, because then you're going to get, you know, you're, the police will come and take you away and say, no, you can't just scream at, a, at an ethnic minority and call them this or that name. You just can't do that. So there, we need to have much better regulation of, of the cyberspace. Uh, and I, I don't have an answer to that, but it's definitely one that if people want to do research, like if you're looking at doing like master's and PhD level research with my academic hat on here, it's a really important area yeah. uh, for, 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 for that young scholars can get into. Yeah, I could relate. Yeah, sorry. Same, uh, I mean, they are not doing it to make some kind of like where they're not really going to right. in that sense that, that I mean, they're situated somewhere, right? Now, obviously, it's a world world and this is happening, but then there is an origin. There is an origin yeah. of everything. So the companies, the group, the countries, and there has to be something that can be identified as, you know, responsible for too much of uh, negative uh, uh, engagement uh, in this sphere. So, I mean, we can't just uh, sort of uh, say that because we don't know and it's all in the virtual world, um, we can't really point out where and who right. exactly is doing. Yeah. Who's the beneficiary? Uh, and we can start from there. So, where was the beneficiary um, getting the most benefit out of that? Uh, uh, can be, uh, I believe, uh, identifier, some of you who think that. Okay. And so, so the internet science, <laughs> that would be, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but then how, uh, what from whom the, they are, those internet giants are getting the better match? <clears throat> state is a sort of powerful, it's all about politics and it's all about the uh, you know, state's interest. So, even if there are internet giants, I mean, they need better match. Um, Joshua, it was an interesting point that you raised. Uh, I think it's already being researched uh, by budding scholars. Uh, I have one sitting before myself. Uh, Vakas is a practitioner, you know, who, who certainly <laughs> monitors uh, a lot of Twitter uh, spaces and debates, not Twitter spaces as in the literal Twitter spaces, but you know, he really has done some exceptional work, and so has his team, uh, and so has. Uh, you know, a number of other scholars, including my own better half, who did her MPhil thesis from National Defense University. She actually focused on use of uh, social media by different violent uh, actors uh, and extremist actors across South Asia. Anyway, I think this uh, certainly brings us to the end of our very uh, engrossing discussion that we had today. And on that note, I will request uh, Director Research. Uh, Brigadier Dr. Rashid Walijan Yuwa for his 